Um, thank you everyone for joining us on, I think, week number 852 or something of Architecture Foundation uh, 100 Days. Um, I'm Will Jennings, London-based writer and visual artist, sort of thinking about things around architecture and built environment. Um, I was lucky enough to do one of these before on horror films and fear and architecture, so um, that was fun, and I thought I'll do another one. Um, and I'm going to be joined by Sonia Lakic, who is an architect, researcher and curator with a PhD in urban studies. And her work evolves around the everydayness of architecture and lived forms of buildings, uh, and hence anthropological and sociological aspects of architectural design and the built environment. And the topics of her curiosity include open architecture and dialectical urbanism, notions of homemaking, housing and informality buildings as living archives, all of this preferably to happen in the post-conflict societies. Uh, she is speaking to us tonight later from Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, and she operates across different disciplines and scales, working visually and collecting all histories, practicing unconventional ethnography and storytelling, mainly through photography and recently, excellently, with filmmaking. Um, also going to be joined by Peter Barber, who's there in this grid of faces. Um, doesn't really need much waving, doesn't need much of an introduction. Um, has worked for Richard Rogers, also, and Jessica and Wiles before establishing his own practice, Peter Barber Architects, in 1989. Um, a design oriented practice specializing in mixed use and residential schemes. And in the 30 years since uh, setting up, has won countless awards, um, including UK Housing Architect of the Year twice, I think, uh, Royal Academy Grand Award for Architecture, and many NLA and RIBA awards. Um, particularly working with community housing stations and local authorities, um, really important at the moment. Ideas of community and subtleties of the sort of shared urban environment spaces, which we'll be talking about tonight, are central to his work. Um, I'm going to be talking for about 15 minutes first, which will stop, and then I'm going to be passing over to Sonia, and then Peter will be wrapping up, and hopefully there'll be like 10 minutes or so um, to have conversation at the end. I need to work out now how to share my screen. Um, this, as you many of you all know, is Peter Barber's um, excellent Peckham Road houses, which I've walked past quite a lot, being a South Londoner. Um, and when I saw these balconies kind of reaching out, growing out towards me, um, again, from the back here, from a different angle, um, it struck me. And I know that on Peter's website, there's a manifesto of Peter Barber Architects, which is a quote from Walter Benjamin, as mentioned which is the passion for improvisation, which demands that space and opportunity be at any price preserved. Buildings are used as a popular stage. They are all divided into innumerable, simultaneously animated theatres. Balcony, courtyard, window, gateway, staircase, roof, are at the same time stages and boxes. And I think this photo here, this sort of idea of the stage, of like these different levels of um, public and private and, and visibility and, and reclusivity are really, beautiful, that stage of the city. And when COVID struck and I was walking on my daily mandated walk, they, these are some fairly dull New London vernacular flats near me, um, built over my real estate, which is a wonderful estate, it's been demolished by the council. Um, and often we see these balconies all over, especially in sort of urban centres like London especially, and I've never seen any on, anyone on them. But the first day of COVID, I went out and it was a sunny day and they were packed. People were working on them, they were sunbathing, um, and it was just a whole way of seeing London and Londoners that I'd not really experienced before. And it made me think about balconies and kind of their role in a future of city and role in COVID. Um, and the history of them, potted history, this is a British military fortification which you would uh, throw oils or rocks down on anyone that would uh, sort of try and attack your castle, which is a, the first proto-balcony, if you like. They were sometimes made of wood and demountable so they could be taken around different parts of the building onto different buildings entirely. Um, at some point someone demounted one and took one into a city so as we often see architecture migrating from the military industrial complex into the urban industrial complex so the forms of architecture move from military into urban and and these sort of ideas of uh, porticos and lodges and balconies were built up in civic spaces so they've become this is in Umbria Monte Falcio which is actually called the balcony of Umbria because it looks over the whole of the region. Um, and it's sort of, this is the place where civic announcements, celebrations and condemnations even were made. Um, so sort of places where the mayor could be seen with people and people, businessmen could be seen from that balcony and they know they had a sense of prestige and been invited at the top table. Um, moving forward, this is um, 
uh, Covent Garden, Inigo Jones's Covent Garden, and we see on the left and the right here, um, balconies then sort of being adopted into sort of the, the wealthier parts of um, domestic architecture. Um, you know, in the same way that the military gets adopted into the city, the civic sort of grandness and, and architectural typologies then move into the, the regular domestic. So people can be seen to be having the same uh, architectural mannerisms and the same relationship to the street. This is a super, super potted history, and um, I'm happy to show any links after this. A lot of really good papers and um, histories of it. Um, and it's also something which, um, oh, I was going to give you a quote from Covent Garden, which is really beautiful in a, in a kind of a weird way. Um, Pepys uh, was writing on uh, uh, the Whig MP, Sir Charles Sedley, in 1663, who uh, had been drinking all day in a tavern, in the Oxford Tavern. And Pepys wrote, he showed his nakedness and abusing of scripture and as it were from thence preaching a mountebank sermon from the pulpit standing on the balcony, saying that there he had to sell such a powder as should make all the cunts in town run after him. A thousand people standing underneath to see and hear him. And that being done, he took a glass of wine and washed his prick in it and then drank it off and then took another and drank to the king's health. Uh, so this idea of the balcony being a place of show and a place of... Um, Sort of public announcement is, is, is not just about the civic announcement, but about very much about the individual. Um, it's also a space that's been taken into art. Um, and when Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet in the late 16th century, there, there was no word in English for balcony. Um, and in fact, there weren't really many balconies uh, or similar sort of looking things in London. But once it became to be performed a lot more, especially around the Covent Garden area by sort of 50 years later in the mid, mid 1600s, um, there were quite a few balconies, but they were largely places of uh, ladies of ill repute uh, uh, would show their wares and themselves um, to the street goers. Um, so they were places of display, and this is a painting by Goya, um, um, which was from, lost the date of the painting, 1808 to 1814. And the two shadowy figures behind are probably the two ladies of him uh, controlling uh, who make it access or, or who they're showing themselves to. Um, there was other plays, not just Romeo and Juliet, were shown. Thomas Nabbs wrote a play in 1633 called Covent Garden. So at the same time that these balconies were popping up and uh, ladies like this were populating them. Um, character one, Art Love says, Mistress Tongal, you are delighting yourself with these new erections. Fair erections are pleasing things, she replies. Indeed, they are fair ones and their uniformity adds much to their beauty. And how like you the balconies, they set off a lady's person well when she presents herself to the view of gazing passengers. So all of the people that had been to see Romeo and Juliet would, 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 would have this idea of, uh, of what balconies were and maybe who would populate them, which is very different to maybe our romantic view of, uh, of Juliet in sort of more traditional uh, portrayals. On the right, we have Ed Ruscha from 1986, the music from the balconies. And I was thinking of this, of what's happening in like, Portland and Chicago with the sort of the, the noises of the streets and probably people observing from the balcony with their Spotify playing in the background and these sort of two worlds colliding. Um, on the left we have uh, Simon, Simone Martini, the miracle of the child falling from the balcony. There's some terrible architecture there uh, where a child has fallen through and sort of St. Augustine of Hippo has just flown down from the heavens just in time to rescue uh, the, the, the fallen child. And on the right is Berthe Morissot and um, her painting on the balcony. She was friend and later sister-in-law to Edward Manet. Um, and there's a, a student who's just graduated from the RCA school, um, MA in writing, called A.M. Demose, um, and I can share the link after, who's just written a book of 11 paintings and um, on 11 paintings about balconies and then a chapter on each one. And I'm gonna be diving into that once this is finished. Um, this is the famous one. Um, Manet, Edward Manet, The Balcony from 1868, 1869, inspired by that Goya we've just seen. Three figures um, in the foreground and then um, in the back of the, the private domestic space. This is really connected to the emergent houseman's Paris and this idea of the balconies, these horizontal structures that fill the street and they offer rigidity to the, the architectural order, and, but they also offer this new kind of performative way of being public and private, of wealth, showing what's indoors, showing yourself in your clothes. And this kind of panopticon sort of surveillance of the street as well, where, where everybody is watching one another. And the view of this painting, we are probably sitting in the balcony, the other side of the street. So we're, we're complicit in this kind of um, this surveillance, if you like. Um, Jonathan Crary, in his book, Suspensions of Perception, in 2001, wrote, 
the balcony delineates a new psychic permeability and mobility where attentiveness becomes a fluctuating membrane, a delicately tuned pattern of folding and unfolding onto the world. Um, and they have become these places of kind of cultural and civic importance, you know, and the individual. You know, there's this famous wedding, uh, you know, from back in the 80s. Um, that sort of incredible moment in 1989, which I think I can sort of just about remember, um, showing my age, um, of Ceausescu sort of delivering a speech from his balcony and sort of the, the crowd and the tide turning against him and that becoming kind of this a tsunami against him. Um, and the balcony being this place which suddenly became a very vulnerable piece of architecture rather than one of um, uh, uh, shouting. Um, obviously there's this, you know, there's one from Germany, um, the dangling baby of, 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 of Michael Jackson. Um, maybe he needed some Augustine of Hippo to sort of come in and rescue the baby at that point as well. I'm sure he was waiting in the heavens if he was needed. Um, and then the famous uh, sort of uh, Chanel advert um, by Jean-Paul Gould, 1990, The Egoist, uh, which if you haven't watched the video of this, it's worth watching a classic Chanel advert of these ladies shouting Egoist in terms in the rhythm to um, Prophokius, um theme from The Apprentice, I think it's called. Um, as they bang and open these shutters relentlessly. So these spaces of, um, of acting and performing. And going back to the Manet, um, there's a version of this which came to mind as I was walking around um, in COVID London. And it wasn't the Manet one, but it was Magritte's reinterpretation of it. Um, the Manet copying sort of Goya and then Magritte referencing Manet. Um, and Foucault, Michel Foucault wrote of this painting, for me, the setting of the balcony offered a suitable place to put coffins. Um, so Magritte told Foucault this. The setting of the balcony offered a suitable place to put coffins. The mechanism at work here might form the object of a learned explanation, which I am unable to provide. The explanation would be valid, indeed beyond question, but that would not make it any less mysterious. And I think this was something that came to mind to me during COVID, when, when the balconies weren't just a place of escape or respite for the self, but they were a place of showing that you were still alive to the world in a place where there was this anxiety and obviously there is an anxiety and this all these 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 graphs of deaths were shooting up just to stand there on an evening and see and be seen was kind of a political act and a self-representation and still seeing these coffins like that is kind of a sort of a powerful thing which just kept coming to mind as we saw in the beginning as well with Bella Chow they became these places of kind of individual and collective performance of violinists and saxophonists and singers and choirs, um, places of exercise. This was that video where everyone sort of saw you know, people on their balcony taking in group exercise, um, places of growing, of, 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 of providing sustenance and, and sort of well-being if you, if you were lucky enough to have a balcony. And all of this was going through my head as, as I look out my window, which doesn't have a balcony. Um, and for me, one of the most poetic and beautiful ones are these sort of what were called um, solidarity baskets, I think especially in Naples, where people who were vulnerable or less mobile could drop down a basket and leave it dangling and, and, and either have their deliveries put in or people would offer things which could then be lifted back up to sort of the sanctity and uh, shielding of, of, of their apartment. So as I say, so, um, walking around London, I just kept, kept seeing balconies more than I'd ever seen them before. Um, my envy and the sort of the sense of how I saw them as being a fairly future-proofing integral part of what the city could be. Um, interestingly, the hydrangea is the only sort of piece of life which lived from Manet's painting to Magritte. Everything else is dead and in a coffin, but the hydrangea lives. And I think that that shows there is potential for life and there is potential for sustenance and, and future proofing for our cities. Um, London balconies, I think they're these, as we address climate breakdown, they don't just have to be a luxury space, and we're about to see a luxury one, but probably critical to what our urban response could be. Uh, with planting invaluable to buffer noise, filtering air, retaining heat and offering shade. And even if just some of all of the city's balconies were transformed in a small way, then heat island effects could be fought against and kind of our collective struggle against climate breakdown could both be supported but also really importantly made visual as well to the outside. Um, these are the sort of balconies we're kind of getting a lot of in London which are called winter gardens which are kind of developers they have to make an external or balcony space. Um, all of the architects amongst you will know more about the building regs and the, the, the rules around it. But what we see is they sort of enclosed spaces, which I, and this is a beautiful photo sent to me by Russell Curtis. Um, and I, it's beautiful to me because there's all this individualization. You really see a sense of people living in these spaces um, or making do. And sometimes it's a dining table, like in the bottom left, or it's just storage. 
but they're kind of really impractical spaces. They're neither hot nor cold, or they're too hot or too cold. They're too small or narrow to have any function. They're just kind of, they're just things that have to be put in. And we saw them at Neo Bankside, Richard Rogers, uh, you know, when he sort of threw off the shackles of all of his social interest um, many years ago, started building things like Neo Bankside. And these winter garden luxury apartments, this one costs £3,000 a month, I think, if you wanted to rent this two bedroom uh, flat, were these winter gardens which were sold as though they looked like rooms. So there's kind of a trickery going on here from the developers and the architects often to, to make it look like a part of the flat when actually it's meant to be external. And I think this comes down to the very nub of public, private, what, what citizenship has become and what our very sort of political idea of self has become. You know, we, we, we could, and obviously this became a famous test, test case when they complained the people in a modern viewing platform were viewing them as though they were about part of the city. Uh, Nick Sorota said they could consider putting up blinds or I think uh, lace curtains. And I think in the end, the judge threw it out saying, look, you know, if you buy a flat with massive windows next to a viewing platform, then people are going to see in. And that is part of what having a balcony is. And I think that should be celebrated and not hidden from. As I nearly finish, and I will pass on in a moment. But this is Lacatan and Vassal, um, you know, who, who have been got lots of plaudits and things. And they came up with that lovely quote of, um, um, "We didn't want to demolish something, but we wanted to add something instead." So instead of demolishing uh, sort of some social housing blocks, um, they they simply wrapped them in a in a skin of balconies, offering this sort of semi-internal and external spaces. And I think at a time when we just cannot demolish buildings anymore. We need to think about what we can do to, to make them more social, make them more civic, and make them more sustainable and human to live in. Um, so they are political spaces, and they're places of independent voice. From Brazil on the left, banging pots against Bolsonaro to Barcelona, and you know, sort of protesting the touristification of the city. They're spaces where we can be show our political and our individual selves, um, and that can still happen in London. We can still rescue it. So this is Golden Lane Estate and the protest that went on there with their banners, I think, last year or the year before. And I'll just finish with a quote from uh, the architect Fred Frederick Kundervasser, um, who wrote of the idea of window rights. And he said that the grids of uniformity was unbearable, and that as individuals, we are never uh, individuals are never identical. A person in a rented apartment must be able to lean out of his window and be allowed to take a long brush and paint everything outside within arm's reach, visible from afar to everyone in the street, so that they know someone lives there who is different from the imprisoned, enslaved, standardized man, man who lives next door. And I think now probably is the time we need something like balconies, right? So the rights of balconies, where we can, we can use them to voice our individual, collective, and political selves unto the world. Um, and then I will pass over to Sonia, who's going to I think talk about some of those political uh, uses of balconies. Stop sharing. There we go. Sonia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Will. Now let me see. I'm not I'm very clumsy person. Share screen. Da -da -da -da. Okay. Do you see what I see? I see what you see. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. I hope Peter can see as well. Okay, so this will be a journey to former Yugoslavia and to the cities of Banja Luka in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Niš in Serbia and Podgorica, the capital of Montenegro. And simultaneously, this will be an insight into what happens with whatever remain from a Yugoslav version of modernism, that is Yugoslav socialist version of modernism, and how our balconies mutate and how do we mutate as individuals and society. So basically, balconies are an excuse for me to contemplate the everydayness of ours. So clearly modifying your apartment is not a site specific phenomenon. Maybe doing it completely illegally is a bit of, you know, kind of specific phenomenon for this region. However, what we do is that in each of these three countries is that we, we modify our dwellings, we extend our balconies, we do it completely illegally. We do have laws, but we simply decide not to follow them anymore. 
So uh, we intervene within the interior, but also, I mean, even, you know, the universe is not the final frontier. So we extend this kind of engagement to the facades as well, where we uh, intervene and uh, we also add different stories and lots of other apartments to what was uh, original structure. And uh, what is very particular to this phenomenon that it happens in the new era that is not only post-Yugoslav, socio, cultural, political era, it is the era of post-privatization of social housing. So this is how we today manifest what it feels like to finally own a property. So this is how one gets to experience the, the home ownership. So uh, we glaze balconies in Podgorica, people uh, also um, glaze them and they use these pieces of physical space to uh, massively to rent them out to, to students who live in very few square meters of space. Uh, this is an intervention from, from uh, Niche in Serbia, a very nice add-on of a lady who wanted a specific place for her, for her uh, plants. And this is a cultural heritage uh, kind of protected um, uh, building. And finally, we also intervene by adding all kinds of things by because we simply follow our sense of style or the lack of the latter. Um, all of these physical changes are, for me, just an excuse to start talking to people. So these kind of conversation also happen in front of the buildings while I observe how people modified what an architect used to design ages ago. And this is where different kind of truths come out uh, and different kind of uh, con uh, confessions. And um, also, as I, as I say, we have laws, but we simply do not follow them. And in Niche, this is also an example of an elderly uh, person who decided to add this structure because his uh, national monument and uh, building didn't have any of them. In Podgorica, we also add these, uh, these structures. And uh, it is quite uh, amazing that one of the very fragile ladies was the one in charge of these uh, interventions inside her house. She was the one removing the walls using a tool called Hiltok. She explained what Hiltok was to me since I had no idea what Hiltok was. So this is basically a story about my never ending love affair with balconies and also people, people's never ending love affair with their dwellings and with breaking the law. So yes, each of us knows that, that this is very wrong, but this doesn't stop us from, from being, um, you know, absolute uh, owners of our own space and um, masters of our own universes. So we simply decide to, to deny the reality in order to feel ourselves comfortable within our personal interiors. And we use the excuse that everybody else is doing it, so why can't we? So all of these are basically exact quotations from uh, the inside apartment conversations that I had with people that, that I met. And sometimes these are very intimate and fragile and, um, these also influenced uh, my perspective research and my ongoing research and my never ending research and also let me question my own position as a researcher and as an architect. And uh, sometimes uh, these interventions are so radical that people like in this case uh, from Montenegro people demolish structural column that is basically carrying the entire skyscraper and then the inspection intervenes and all of this happens when you have an incapable husband so as one of the ladies advised me be careful who you marry okay so and uh yes Will already knows the story but I was also during these conversations because it was very important for me to see what what is really home and how this dwelling practice occurs now in this new reality. This is what also happens, like personal confessions and you become a marriage counselor and psychologist. So this is when you trained as an architect, you have to work with all kinds of disciplines involved. And these kind of conversations that start with balcony and physical changes of what used to be an original design often end up with getting to know what are contemporary morals and ethics and what is important to to people uh yeah 
advice number one, like I said, be careful who you're marrying because that is the most important thing in your life to find a good husband. And also if you're a girl to wear a dress because if you wear skinny jeans, you can look as a mosquito and wear a makeup. So um, we build balconies on top of the uh, entrances to our buildings. Basically we occupy what used to be, I cannot even define the rooftop up above the entrance building as, as a common space because how do you define a rooftop? We occupy it, we build a balcony, we glaze them, we convert them into different rooms. We also intervene by adding uh, extra openings and we sell style any additional uh, windows that we find necessary. Uh, people usually do this by um, simply bearing in mind their own financial cap capabilities. So what also these modifications can um, let you know, they can, they can inform you who is who in the nation of the homeowners today solely on the basis of the material people use. And these sometimes simply correspond to the Uri Gibson Knauf uh, uh, boards. Um, so yes, we intervene also in the interior in all the possible way. We simply enjoy this personal universe of ours. And sometimes also condominiums intervene in a way that, okay, there is an altered balcony, but also there is a renovation of facade that for some reason leave those um, that are not financially uh, well standing without a properly renovated part of the building that belongs uh, to them. So this uh, balcony phenomenon also states about this shift from the socialist living of being together to this new tendency of being alone and you know going back to to, to yourself in your own uh, micro uh, world by all means. And uh, yeah, this is how it this is how it looks like. It's an, it, it is an explosion of whatever styles and tastes and de demands and needs and materials. And since it's an ongoing discussion and never ending love affair, as I said, I extended it to pandemic. And uh, this was, this is a still from uh, a movie uh, I did as part of um, my uh, future architecture um, fellowship experience for this year. And this is where I got to learn that uh, people from one of the most famous modernist neighborhoods in Banja Luka called Boric, Boric actually fell in love not only with their balconies, but also with pandemic itself. So uh, it was very uh, interesting to do this kind of personal journey and to see how balconies facilitate uh, this new uh, life and this shared cosmology of a lockdown that each of us experienced. And since it was very personal journey, I, um, I extended it to the rooftop terrace that uh, I, I stated that it saved uh, our lives, my families, my neighbors' lives during, during the war. So basically I used this to pay tribute to these kind of structures and also <laughs> to request to ask architects to please please give humankind balconies and terraces because these sometimes save lives and yeah there is no proper conclusion but i love balconies and i'm never gonna quit on them so please neither do you peter <laughs> thank you stop sharing okay Peter, over to you, I think. Peter's muted. Peter's muted. There he is. Okay. Can you see that? Yes. Oh, fuck. Thank fuck for that. Okay, good. Um, right, why isn't it moving? Okay, I think I need to do full screen, don't I? Uh, no, I am in full screen. You're in full screen. It, it looks perfect. Yep. Oh, there we are. Okay. So, right, lots of um, resonances in, in both what Will and Sonia have said, and in fact in Will's essay, which I read in advance of this session in preparation about balconies. Um, and um, I'm going to show you some pictures of things, balconies that I like, and of stuff that we've done ourselves. But I want to broaden it out a little bit, because I, I've always been fascinated by the front of buildings, by the, um, the wall which separates 
um, us as individuals from the world outside. And when I read Will's essay about balconies, and he was talking about the intersection of uh, space which is private and space which is public, I was reminded of a quote um, from uh, Marshall Berman, a short sentence in which he's and um, I thought that was really lovely, and it kind of made me think about um, the relationship between, you know, what it is to be in the city, um, at times, you know, in the street, um, be, uh, uh, operating a sort of collective political uh, manner in which uh, we see people here in London in the 70s saving Covent Garden from the bulldozers, um, but also um, us as individuals uh, and being more reflective um, and being more private and being more domestic. Um, and so it seems to me the balcony operates at the intersection of those two worlds. And, and that is one of the things that makes them really fascinating. But there are other things. There are oriel windows, there are front gardens, there are roof terraces. Um, and I'll be showing you some pictures of those as well, because I think um, they, they're doing some of the, some similar things. Um, this picture is a cue um, for me to kind of reiter reiterate really what um, uh, Will was saying about uh, Walter Benjamin and the idea of a city and of buildings and the facades of buildings, the fronts of buildings being animated and activated by, the, by their occupation, by the people who are using them. And does architecture really being nothing until the colour and, and frantic activity of the kind of urban scene emerges uh, and is overlaid onto it? And that, that for me is really where architecture lies. Um, and, um, so that's, that's the city of Naples, which has cropped up a couple of times already in this conversation. But here we are in Brighton, um, and here, you know, no balconies here, but nevertheless, um, a, an attempt by people, this is a street in, in Brighton, to, um, to, to take control of the space outside of their houses with, on windowsills and in, 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 in hanging baskets and on, and, and on stuff on the street next to their front doors. And it seems to me this is a rather a wonderful scene. Um, these are roof terraces. These are ones which um, have been a great inspiration for our work in our office uh, and in the development of what we call a notched terrace, a notched terrace, which is a kind of hybrid um, terrace building, terrace typology, which incorporates roof terraces and, and raised courtyards. Um, and here we have um, a, a, an Adolf Loos scheme, one, one of his, I think, probably less well-known and unbuilt ones, in which um, a balcony is less of an add-on, less of a projection, less of a cantilever and more integral to the overall typology and form of the building. Um, and clearly one that was related uh, to Neve Brown's Alexandra Road, where, you know, this is, a, this is a kind of balcony becomes landscape. And, and, the, and as I say, the sort of ziggurat format uh, kind of gives it that sense of, of it being kind of landscape. And so this is balcony writ large. Um, and, and, you know, so one has been inspired by these, by these precedents. And this is a, 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 actually, this is down in Cornwall. It's a hotel built into a hillside, which is, it's just all balcony. Um, and this is our um, Beverage Muse project in Stepney. It's social housing. Um, and again, the overall form of the building is one that lends itself to occupation. It invites occupation. It's, it's, it's kind of demanding that. Um, and so that's on day one, but it's just rather wonderful to go back and to find uh, these extraordinary, you can't, you can't predict, you know, there's lots of architects tuned into this, I hope. And, and you know, you'll agree with me that, you, you, you know, architecture isn't causal. It doesn't force people to do things, but it gives them the opportunity to do, to do so. And it's lovely to go back and to find a balcony and, and a little flower bed um, has, you know, given people that opportunity and, and, and they felt enabled and, and, and um, they felt creative in response to that. So here we ha are in Peckham Road. Will showed a picture of the rear of the building, which has projecting balconies. But in this uh, image, you can see what I'm talking about, that the actual overall form of the building um, is what is it is, 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 doing the, is doing the job really. It's very integral to the actual architecture. It's not something that's added on. This is day one and I'm looking forward to see, you know, I, I, want, I want the building to get covered up. You know, for me, it, it, it get, things get interesting when people take control of their environment. I mean, there are, there are people who disagree with me and a kind of a, a, kind, of, a, a, a kind of a modernist um, uh, a kind of outlook on these things would might you know, I remember Neve Brown saying he, he was really perturbed by people you know you were talking about Sonia um, people kind of 
putting little uh, extensions onto their balconies and so on, and Neve being really perturbed by that and feeling that um, that wasn't what he wanted to see on his balconies and on his on, on, on his on his building. I I am uh, the opposite. I, I'd love to see our building disappear under under the, under other people's world, and and for it to become special um, as a consequence. And I, and I'm hopeful it's already starting to happen down there, which is great. I mean, here's a kind of crazy, more elaborate version of the same thing. Um, we're building this one in um, North London at the moment, the North Circular is to the right, and uh, this sort of terraced stepping down um, section uh, is something we've also adopted um, at this project. In, as I say, it's called Beechwood Muse in North London. Donny Brook, some of you will know, but and here there are, there are several things going on here. Um, there's oriel windows projecting out over the street. Those windows are, are, are give people opportunity to look up and down the street, but they're also almost like little display cabinets. There are flowers, there are t cuddly toys, um, um, uh, um, and again, this is this is a photograph taken, you know, very early on. But um, th those things have appeared, and apparently, on those balconies, which are um, tiny, obviously, in the World Cup. Um, uh, it's a very cosmopolitan uh, group of people living there and people were hanging their flags from those so it's lovely to see. So this back of pavement terrace, no front garden here, very intense relationship between the street and the interior of the building but the building pushing out over the street and so blurring this, this, um, this space uh, or occupying the space between the public world and people's private world and people taking control of those spaces and the roof terraces. And an oriel window again, and a front a window and a front door. And um, so this kind of brings me to front gardens again. This is a an extreme form of of that, and this has become a, a, a very used space because these buildings have no back gardens. They're back to back, uh, effectively buildings down in um, Peckham. Some of you will know it, Schumann Square, and so everybody, if they want outside space, is invested in the space at the front of their building and you get this extraordinary kind of environment emerging. And it's an idea that we borrowed uh, for some old people's housing in Dagenham, where every house has no back garden, but they have a little front garden onto this little passageway or twitten. And this is one week in, this is what's started to happen as people have occupied this pe this, the, the space at the side of the street and their private world has sort of emerged onto the, onto the street edge. This is a, you know, this is a, 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 a very, for me, and it's a really inspiring image, um, which I saw in walking around a town in the Dordogne. Um, and somebody, a, a recess into the front of a building, uh, a, 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 an entranceway, but also a space that they turned into uh, an extension of their home, rather in the manner of a, of a Louisiana stoop or porch. Um, but as I say, this is in the south of France. This is back-to-back -back housing uh, in um, the north of England and uh, the bay window becoming uh, a, an extension out into the street and again blurring that separation between the, the interior um, and the street itself. These I think are in Wales. And here's the stoop, um, you know, uh, uh, not, not, some, not, not a feature of our, our um, domestic architecture in this country but absolutely one in the southern states of America and also in the Caribbean and one which I think is really fascinating. For us it's hard to achieve because we have uh, accessibility uh, lo uh, you know, uh, legislation which means that we can't have steps up to front, door up to front doors. Um, but I think it's a really fascinating um, way of being and of living and, and, and of, of again kind of um, the people's world becoming the edge of the street. But here is um, a, a, our version of, of the stoop, and it's a kind of level access stoop, and we've invested a lot in this building. Each one of those is a house uh, in creating this deep recess into the front of the building, two stories high, parabolic arch. Those are kitchens on the ground floor, and that we hope that uh, people on the, in these buildings, they're back to back. They have the, a roof terrace if they want to be private. They have a balcony at second floor level, and they have a space at street edge kind of 800 deep uh, directly onto the pavement um, and you know we hope that, um, that, 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 that those street frontages will become kind of um, uh, used by the people who live there. Um, 
This is another project in Enfield where we've again put a great deal of attention into how the building meets the street, both in the form of these terraces at first floor level, little balconies at first floor level, but also recessed arches and a lot of attention given to the kind of a, the, the boundary treatments in those jolly walls. And that looks like it's where it ends. So I'll unshare. Thank you, Peter. And thank you, Sonia. I think what's really interesting about the two of your sort of um, <clears throat> talks there is about this idea of, well, two things. There's the, the, the obvious one about um, like the personal adaption of space. And sometimes you're building that offer into the place. Like, you know, Peter, you're sort of talking about those the steps in the door door in which kind of are inviting plants and objects and people to perch upon them. Or sometimes people are just doing it themselves, as we saw with the houses in, um, in Sonia's talk, where people are literally just, I don't know what that tool was called, but chiseling away at walls or putting up windows or, you know, turning balconies into student bedrooms, which are, you know, probably even smaller than the, 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 the permitted development flats we're seeing popping up in Britain. Um, but people are just doing it themselves. So there is this sort of, there's a real love of architecture there, which certainly in my experience of talking about architecture, it's just never there in the sort of the media conversation. The people do engage with architecture once that offer is there or once they they're given the opportunity or the, the lack of uh, sort of supervision to stop them just at making their own place because it's in our nature, it's in our kind of human DNA. And then the other thing which I think was beautiful and then propped up especially in Peter's talk is how kind of differently to what I was saying, I was saying they're sort of places of display and this visual connection but you're you know that you're talking about this threshold about being one where uh, the, the porches in 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 southern american states um and similar being places where they kind of an offer of an invitation to come in if you're on the porch then you kind of i'm here and you can come and chat to me and i'm part of the community if the door's shut or i'm not on the porch then look i'm busy or i'm just in my own space and you we saw in your properties the last one at the end there where kind of there's a threshold and then the door the door's left open people can come in. And I was talking to residents of like Cressingham Gardens estate recently, um, which I think is a really beautiful um, place to look at in terms of this idea of public, private um, and community. And they talk there about how they leave their doors open and it shows to their neighbours that, yeah, come in and chat, I'm here. And, you know, I've certainly never lived in a place where one could do that. And if we could build more of that in, that's great. I think the, on, on the, um, on the, um, uh, um, the stoops. I think. I think the the, the level change is, is subtle but significant. So, uh, and, and it's, it's 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 hard to achieve with level, level access because that those steps do just um, you do sort of need to be invited. I think. Mm, yeah, when, yeah. When the doors open, and and there is that there are these there's a sort of gradation from the from the room inside to the front door to the porch to the steps to the street. So, it's quite a, quite interesting the way it works. I think. The other thing that I've been, Sonia used the word everydayness, which I thought was a good one. And um, I'm a big fan of um, Michel de Certeau and, and the practice of everyday life. And um, this is, uh, as, as well as us thinking about the, the balcony being a place for display, but it's also where everyday life is enacted, you know, and uh, as well as being a, a box, like a theatre box to, to observe, it's also a stage, isn't it? Yeah, I think you and I have had a chat on Twitter before, sharing photos with others about washing being hung up. Oh, yeah. And like you were saying, that's a really beautiful way. Of, and I, for me, it's like showing individuality. You know, everyone's got their own knickers and T-shirt combination and they're on display. There's something human about it and not precious. But also it's individual. And, and I was talking to some like leaseholders in London who have balconies, but they're not allowed more than one pot plant over 50 centimetres, no more than one chair and a table, but it has to be packed up at night. And it's kind of, I get in a post Grenfell world, there's, you know, maybe security reasons. In the Barbican, for instance, means of egress run across the balcony. Um, and also, you know, um, but I think a lot of it is also, um, which um, maybe Sonia can talk to, is about this idea of presentation and like this sort of the state or the developer or the building owner wanting to show a certain idea of neatness and an idea of neatness which does not allow for the individual or mess or chaos which is all human and part of civic society. And how that's kind of built out. I know that in former Yugoslavia, uh, Kauchescu had people that visited um, uh, uh, cities before he had a rival. And they would look around areas where there were kind of messy balconies and then send these people on training courses to kind of go and learn how they should 
uh, keep a better balcony. And obviously what that meant was actually that it was to do with migration from rural and poor areas to the city. People would keep their washing out or grow vegetables. And there was a certain class uh, built, uh, sort of status built into that. Um, you know, and we see it now in flats in Docklands where everything looks the same, or Elephant and Castle, there's not a single, like, an inch of personality on any of those balconies because they're probably all for Airbnb or, you know, rented out by landlords. Sonia, is that something you've come across? Um, so the limits of control about showing and control from the state, or is that all now gone in the capitalist world? Uh, I'm thinking uh, there was this, uh, there was this very popular TV show. And of course, I, I don't remember the exact name. It was about families moving into these newly constructed flats. And I think that TV show was either officially or unofficially used to educate people from former Yugoslavia, mostly rural population who suddenly started living in cities, you know, in dwellings, how to deal with this new uh, experience. And the, um, this, um, I'd say, control and this strict way of life, uh, I mean, we were not allowed to, to change the color of our windows, for example, during the, I think we started changing it, yeah, when, after the war, so it, from the mid-90s on, because, I mean, th this was, our architecture was the embodiment of brotherhood and, and uh, unity ideology. I mean, this was this commonality and we were this one for one for all uh, kind of uh, society and I think there there was really strict way how to not even how to deal with architecture itself but how to live inside what the system has provided you with you know someone someone invested someone gave you this this uh, apartment you can use it till forever and ever and this was also uh, this was also very well facilitated through series of norms that were visibly exhibited, I'd say, displayed in each of the buildings. I mean, there, there were really, there was a lot of norms to, to follow. Uh, how to treat your environment, how to treat the, the, the neighborhood, how to treat your neighbor. And I think that all, all of this was clearly a manifestation of order and state and why some of the people find these um, balconies and add-ons interesting is because I mean it it reminds us that there is no more state I mean not mm -hmm. state of that kind and I think that somehow there is something with human beings that when you see a strict geometry or something precise in terms of form of shape it reminds you of an order and you know you shouldn't go against this order mm -hmm. I think that uh, on the one hand it can be what happens now in former Yugoslavia is problematic. On the other hand, I cannot say it's bad because it's beautiful to see how people are, you know, enjoying this personal freedom. And it's bad if someone's chipping away a supporting column of 10 floors above them. I mean, there are, <laughs> it's about where we find that limit of control, I guess. Exactly. Um, but there is that thing then. I think we share it in a sort of a, in a neoliberal um, sort of Western place like London, and it's something certainly in sort of a communist space. It's about this facade. As long as things look okay on the outside, as long as those blocks of flats that are just built in Elephant and Castle or Nine Elms in, you know, in Batsy around the Velvet, as long as they look shiny and they look fine, no one's going to question the, the, the draining of capital, the fact there's no one living in them or no one can afford them, the fact that it's, it's building, you know, the, um, it's building a kind of city which is completely inhuman, I think, and in many ways. Um, but it's, you know, it's this kind of the idea of this broken window sphere, I guess. If, if one balcony in a Yugoslavia or in London shows something different, then how do, what happens then? They might all be individual, and then there's people, and then how do we control this? Um, we have a question from Nick Walker, and I encourage anyone else to throw some questions if anything comes in. One more has just come in, but we'll deal with Nick's first. Maybe this is for Peter. Um, is there an optimum width? an optimum length and an optimum height from ground level for a balcony. I think, I think Nick's going to be building a balcony soon and he wants to get some free architectural advice. Um, and what are your thoughts on Juliet balconies? Um, Can I expand on that? Yeah, oh yes, jump in, please. Hello, sorry, I was on mute. I mean, it's a pretty simple question. 
Um, first of all, Will, Sonia, and Peter, thank you for a fantastic talk. That was a superb way to finish the Thursday. Um, but I'm just really interested in the whole idea of the size of balconies. Um, I live in Glasgow, and balconies are not the norm up here. And you know where we have tried to do them, like with um, uh, Basil Spence's Hutchison blocks in the Gorbals, or indeed the Red Road flats. Um, they haven't been successful. So I think there's something to do also with, um, with climate and balconies, um, particularly here because it's very wet. Um, but I just love this idea that, um, you know, the balcony can get too big or too small or too wide or too high above. So right opposite my window, there's some balconies that are 20. Um, but equally, <laughs> they with dry quickly. <laughs> well, they're winter gardens now, so they, they, they work really, really well. Um, but equally, a lot, of, a lot of balconies tend to get used for storing bicycles um, because you can't actually get a chair onto them. So they look like something that's very useful, um, but actually they're fairly um, limited. And then the last thing, I suppose, is a lot of balconies come to be used for storage because in this day and age, people are having to store their vacuum cleaners in their cars. So yeah. is there an optimum size and an optimum height? And, and I just, I'll pass on to Peter, but you mentioned Juliet balconies, which I just find kind of weird, bizarre things. Um, but I, I don't know, Peter, I mean, you, you've done balconies from 10 foot deep to probably Juliet balconies. What's yeah, <laughs> I, I think, that, yeah, I don't really have a strong view on the size of balconies. I mean, you know, in, in um, sort of Georgian Piano Nobles, you get balconies which are a foot deep, you know, maybe 400 and... Um, they people put stuff out on them, you know, pots out on them and things like that. I think they were decorative, you know, um, iron work. Um, with the, the ones at Donnybrook are about just enough space for one person to get out of their bedroom and have a cigarette, first cigarette of the day. I remember thinking about that. Um, and but there are other spaces within the building, so so they feel quite precipitous, you know, the way they stick out. And you you mentioned the ones at Peckham Road. Um, sometimes it's nice to be in a balcony that's, that's more enclosed, that feels more like a roof terrace and a, a maybe, maybe a sort of raised courtyard. So I don't think, I think it depends on what you, you know, sometimes they project out of a corner of the building and they enable you to see either way down a street. Sometimes <coughs> they're all real windows, so they're actually not open, they're enclosed and it's a place you can, maybe this would work in uh, up the, uh, high up on, uh, on the side of a tower block in, in Glasgow, um, you know, somewhere you can sit. Um, and be outside but inside. So, um, all manner of things. We have a question to follow up on, which I'd like to sort of throw to you as well, but from Luciana Martinez, um, who's asked about the, the use of balconies and whether it's sort of the design of a balcony and the size and the, the, the positions, especially like Peckham Road, you've got them built at the back away from the main road, um, a solid versus open, projecting or recess, and how this changes kind of the use. And I guess as an architect, how you think of that before. So those, you know, are you thinking about them as rooms or as just outside offers of people to use what they want? Or how much of that do you kind of program in and how much do you just let? Well, well, I mean, there are, there, are, there are requirements, you know, in terms of size, but, um, 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 which is a bit annoying. But um, <laughs> and, and so, so some, you know, but I, in, when, when I answered the last question, I was describing all sorts of different types of balconies and the feeling that you get from mm -hmm. them and the, and, what, and the sort of thing that might happen on them. Mm -hmm. But I, I, you see, we, uh, our, our first questioner um, was talking about, is everybody still there? Yes, <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Yeah. Yeah. AF just wanted to show us their logo. You know, every, every, their so, logo. You know I, you see, the thing is, I think if people want to put their balconies and their laundries and their, you know, it's absolutely up to people. And, I, and I, I'm with you, Will, I think it's, it's great to see mess on people's back. If people want to have a messy balcony or do nothing with their balcony or, it's, you know, and I, and I really think that, uh, you know, I've, I've talked to clients and planners uh, who have said they think it's disgraceful when people don't, you know, look after their balconies. And I just think that's just bullshit. Mm. Because yeah, there's this there's a system that what does look after mean? If I if I was to grow vegetables and leave my bike, which I'm going to be repairing next month, I promise on my balcony, that's me using it. So who, who, why is it for someone else to say what good use is or what an aesthetic value judgment or a good social function of a, a balcony is? And, and social spaces and cities and that public private they're messy. So like you know, being a human is messy. Being a community is messy. Um, so they kind of should be as well. You know. We should allow the psychology of, of what architecture is to spill out, just as we should of ourselves, and we shouldn't store all of our mess inside. Mm. I was oh, thinking about what Sonia was talking okay. about, Will. I was thinking about what Sonia was talking about, 
you know, this idea that um, people ought to be able to more freely um, change their change their buildings and add bits on and glaze things in. And we're allowed to do that at the back of our buildings. You know, we're allowed to extend at the rear of our buildings. And I just don't understand why we couldn't have... Uh, it'd be interesting to explore the possibility with the planning department to say, mm -hmm. could we on this street say that, you know, there's a zone four metres in front of these buildings where people can build anything out at the front, you know, and that's, that's allowed, you know, up to a, a particular height and percentage. So and so to, to actually encourage the kind of thing that Sonia is saying people have to do in a sort of guerrilla kind of tactics and make it happen, make it possible for people to do that, you know, on the street edge. Mm -hmm. There's the Islamic think, um, architectural oh, no, idea that, of Fina. Oh, I just yes. saw it really quickly before, Perfect. because Don't I think then. that that's actually really one of the things that I thought was interesting is we take, um, we quite readily accept this idea of balconies for the floors that are above. But for some reason, when we go down, I guess, if you, I don't know what you'd call it, but call almost a balcony at ground floor. Like there were some beautiful images that you showed, Peter, that just having that small space and allowing people to kind of spill out into that space without building a, like a wall up or something that it can completely change the, the street and almost get people actually out of their, out of their homes. We talk a lot about open spaces and parks and things, but it's actually quite impressive that just having that, allowing people to spill out onto the street can, Mm. almost create that little pocket of open space that, that maybe we're all craving in some space in some yeah, it, it's something i noticed on the same walk when i was taking those photographs of balconies i lived just on a, a south london 1880s kind of area of um three-story flats uh red brick flats and outside the front of each building there's like an area where it's just everyone's two massive wheelie bins and you know it's just concreted over all the way up the road it's wheelie bin wheelie bin wheelie bin and the beginning of covid when it was really sunny suddenly everyone had put the wheelie bins on the street and they were all sitting out there with laptops or camparis or books or whatever and talking to each other. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of building it in a bit more of a utopian vision of what it was, but I've never seen those spaces used for anything other than wheelie bins or the occasional pop fly. And looking down the street, I saw maybe 15 people one afternoon and it was just really nice. <laughs> and, and, and now we're seeing it again with streets that are turned over to kids and bikes and, you know, cyclists and, uh, and, and less cars. And we're seeing how cities... Uh, can be reinvented. Sonia, how, th how have things been in COVID um, in Bosnia? Are streets being closed and people opening up a, to a new city or is it just back to normal? No. I mean, it, people laugh at me when I say this, but seriously, COVID, please, like every once in a while we have a horrible crisis. So this is, this is just another day for us. So in that sense, I don't think that, that anything has changed in, in, in particular. So some of the people were really saved by, by the balconies. And ironically, I live in an apartment, like all my love for balconies, and I live in a ground floor apartment that has no balcony mm -hmm. and has no access to, to, to the courtyard. Me so too. I think that's why we're fascinated by them. <laughs> um, we have to wrap up soon. I just want to bring Nick Walker back in. I don't know if he wants to ask the question or if he's happy for me to read it out. It's not really a question. I was just yes. continuing the conversation just, just about um, uh, yeah, that idea of all, all outdoor spaces really having been rediscovered. There are lots of, lots of stories up in Glasgow about you know, residents who've not really hung out together, who've got more time on their hands because they're at home, who've been cutting back all the back courts and really using them as, you know, vital community spaces. And mm -hmm. I suppose that's, that's what tenement flats have, is they have this sort of communal back court rather than um, balconies. Yeah, I think the sort of forgotten spaces in cities and in houses are suddenly people are noticing them, remembering them again. And I think the important thing for all of us, whether we are architects or critics or citizens who just go about our daily lives, is to kind of keep them alive somehow. So if we keep those spaces alive or we find new ways of using them or we keep that street closed for cars or we keep that balcony used for pot plants, then suddenly, you know, it's not going to be a radical reimagining of, of cities. London will still become polluted and, and you know, angry in a few days' time. Um, but we might find subtle little shifts in, in changing individuals, small communities, and through that, hopefully bigger manifestation. I think we better wrap up there. I think people nodding and um, 
everyone's hungry for dinner. But I want to thank Peter and Sonia hugely for flying in from their respective born, um, Brighton and um, Bosnia um, and, and everyone else for joining us. And I've put some links up in the chat. So, um, you know, there's some um, various articles and people's websites to have a look out there.